Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Shahab Karni from I-95 Television Washington Studios. I'm here with a very knowledgeable, I will say very well educated, not in terms of education only, but in terms of investment, financial markets. I have with me Shahal Khan. Shahal, welcome to my studios today. Thank you very much. Salam and viewers, you. we are going to discuss today as we announced Pakistan, US, and China. All three, and fortunately and unfortunately, all three are nuclear state as well. And big markets, uh, China is of course number one market, US, big market. Pakistan, not so big, but at least 220 million people. And geopolitically situation at a place where we're just at a flashpoint of nuclear war. So today we are going to talk about economic parity and equality and how a geopolitical diplomatic relationship or dynamic can be built. So Shahal, not only in academics, as I said, but also very much engaged in the financial market. And why I picked him up, because he has got his interest and eyes in that region real time. So Shahal, whatever I just put in the intro, do you agree with that? Go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, I thank you so much for inviting me. And and actually, if I start looking down while I talk, it's because this is such a um, important topic that you know there's uh, notes I've written down before our conversation that I want to make sure that I cover. And I wanted to cover um, what is the actual possibility of of this working in favor, um, this China and U.S. Um, sort of focal point, which is becoming Pakistan to a degree. Um, there's many other focal points where I think the two are meeting and uh, there's a lot of geopolitical differentiations that are going on in strategy based on many things that are changed. I think uh, COVID and all the pressures that came along with it have accelerated a lot of these geopolitical um, instances where uh, these two countries uh, are, are meeting each other. And uh, so if I do continue to look down, it's, it's because I want to make sure that I cover all the points. But I don't agree that the U.S. and China should be aggressive to each other. Um, uh, and I think that there are two different cultures. We have a Western culture and an Eastern culture. And in my view, the U.S. is a, a culmination of a Western culture uh, philosophy that has been uh, propagated and accelerated and, and, and mightified, if I may say, over the last, you know, since World War II as the super, uh, the super mind trust of Western philosophy. You may call it uh, the mechanical philosophy, the mind philosophy, the philosophy of corporations, of, uh, of uh, globalization, uh, which means uh, that the U.S. after World War II and then uh, controlling the oil market, the fuel market, becoming the, the world's central reserve currency sort of protector has um, always uh, reacted as a, as um, after, especially after the Soviet Union fell, as the world sort of beacon uh, in, in, in um, sending out its financial culture, its, its mind uh, culture, educational culture. But, you know, the, that culture in itself now is uh, at certain points politically, academically being confronted with Eastern culture, uh, which is the Chinese side of it. Now, now people in the United States and, and a lot of people are, are looking at China as the enemy. They're looking at it as a, as a machine. They're looking at it as a sort of an atheistic government, uh, you know, enslaving the people moving forward. But we have to also understand one thing. We shouldn't demify China. We should look at China as a 5,000 plus year old culture. Uh, yes, in the recent past, they've ad adopted what they've adopted, but we have to remember one thing, that China uh, came into the sort of manufacturing system due to Pakistan and the meeting between Kissinger and Mao, where we attracted them to come out of pure communism. And, and we, as the United States or the West, made a deal with them where we would give them our manufacturing in exchange for them to uh, break away from the Soviet Union and to break that pact. And so that was our deal with them. And uh, since then, 
they have done a tremendous amount of uh, development in their country to bring a massive amount of people out of poverty. I think it's the largest amount of people that have come out of poverty uh, ever that ever existed in, 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 our hist in our human history. Along with that, China has also paid a very high price of pollution uh, you know, in its country and, 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 and uh, possibly um, rights of its people to a degree to get things done. So I think China itself, in talking to a lot of friends in China, the new generation in China wants to clean up. They also want to have a certain amount of um, assimilation to uh, a lot of Western ideals like sustainability, like uh, uh, environmental cleansiness. They've made a pact to go completely without fossil fuels in the next few years. So what I'm trying to say is the way Pakistan needs to look at things, and this is very important, is not from the angle of a military antithesis of war rhetoric that everybody's going to fight each other and it's either this or either that. What we must do as Pakistan is look at the fact that the Chinese are human beings. They also want to sustain themselves. They also want to establish their, um, their ways of thinking, but their philosophy is 50 years out. They want to do long-term development. Then Pakistan, that has been with the United States since uh, World War II and, and has been with it throughout these wars, they have to understand the Western philosophy based in Washington has been short term. The United States, and this is the one Achilles heels of the U.S. UK, U.S. has an amazing amount of great things to it, right? Achievements and, uh, and, and, and industrial and financial markets. But it also has some weaknesses also to it, which is that it thinks very short term. The U.S. is always short term and it's always led its foreign policy through the promotion of its culture, but the complete control over their economies within the dollar. Its main premise is to keep the dollar, the central reserve currency and everything along with that intact. Now, everything is changing. The U.S., for many reasons, is seeing itself now no, no longer capable of running the whole world. China is now looking at itself as an expansion tool for its long-term philosophies of Belt and Road and its cultural philosophies and its sort of help of developing other countries. You know, a lot of people have said that they also have some issues in the way they're doing it, but they're looking at it 50 years out. So you have these two different dichotomies, these two different ways of thinking. And Pakistan is one of the places in the world, there's several others, where they, were, they will start to overlap. And the the U.S. will look at Pakistan as a place where um, it has to do with its, its, its interest in Central Asia, its interest in supporting uh, the Middle East. It's a, Pakistan is, of course, a very powerful Muslim nation with nuclear weapons. And it's not going to want Pakistan completely out of its control, you know, due to uh, uh, the resources and also its proximity to India. And I think this administration is going to go... Uh, and 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 become closer to India, and there's already that antagonism between India and China, you know, on the Ladakh side. And Pakistan, in my view, should understand that it should look at both of the cultural narratives and understand that one is looking for a long-term development, but asking for uh, investment in, in in Pakistan through debt and infrastructure. And the other one, the United States is a bit lost. It doesn't know how to approach Pakistan because it can't approach Pakistan through only its military anymore, right? In terms of military uh, exchanges or funding from the military. It needs to approach Pakistan from another angle, but it doesn't know how to do it. So what I've always been saying is get the United States to come in and invest in Pakistan from the ground up. Have them put in equity. Pakistan is missing equity. It's got enough debt coming in from China, which is good. China has done an amazing job in Belt and Road Initiative infrastructures and things like this. But Pakistan is missing its equity. And right now, what I feel is, and this is what I've been uh, telling people in the United States, uh, in the administration, also financial investors, is there is a huge amount of capability in Africa, in um, Central Asia, in South America, where China is making inroads by building infrastructure in the top-down approach, that you must go the bottom-up approach. Go and invest in villages. Go and invest in power grids in the villages through solar. Put in data centers to allow them to connect to the internet. 
bring in uh, sustainable agriculture, go from the bottom up and also take an approach in that manner to bring U.S. technology and companies and innovation. Uh, that is the way that the United States needs to move forward. But U.S. cannot move forward in terms of uh, using the uh, U.S. versus China angle in countries like Pakistan. And it can't move in aggressive ways because the U.S. will lose, uh, Pakistan will lose, and also, to a degree, China will lose because also the Chinese, uh, I don't think the Chinese, uh, uh, looking at it from a positive view, want to come to Pakistan and take away Pakistan's resources because Pakistan can't pay, can't pay its debts. You know, there's been a lot of issues that the way that Chinese design their debt programs are very bad for their countries. And look, let's be honest, the U.S. is famous with the World Bank and IMF for developing horrible debt packages that uh, took away countries' resources. The U.S. did it for many years. And so um, what I'm trying to say is the only way that U.S. and China can work together in Pakistan and work in unison is for Pakistan and the people in Pakistan to realize how to relate to both of them in a manner which is not to create a conflict, but to look at what the positive is in both sides and to appeal to that positive. Invite the uh, Americans in to invest in innovation and invest in equity. Invite the Chinese in to do the infrastructure and the top-down approach. And I think we'll find a way to bridge and end up with the most success out of this. Sal Khan, very articulate. Uh, you gave the solution, you know, from top to bottom and bottom up, good convergence and combination. I like that example. My question to you, Shahal, because you have been involved with the, pre uh, not involved, but engage at the intellectual conversation level. You have seen the Trump administration for the last four years. And now we have got a lot of friends in Biden administration, not only uh, through the administration, but their involvement with different think tanks. We have been engaged with them for years. Do you see a sea change of thought process when it comes to dealing with India, with China, with Middle East, and with, with Pakistan? Because in context of this Jared Kushner, Abraham Accord and everything, where do you see the new Biden administration going way forward? Yeah, well, I think that... Uh, the work that was done for the Abraham Accord should not be reversed. Um, I think that is something where we have to, as um, as a you know nations of let's say the Abrahamic religions, um, we have to look at ways now of the future. Um, the biggest irony and the biggest curse that a lot of our cultures have is to look too much in the past. And whatever's happened in the past has happened in the past. But let's look at the present and then maybe dream of the future. And the present is that from Morocco all the way down to Indonesia, you know, we have an Abrahamic culture that is the remnants of um, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, uh, and various tribes that are now formed into countries and but still maintain a cultural identity with the religion that is very strong in the culture. The Abraham Accord finally starts to get back to historical roots of the Abrahamic religions not being at heads with each other. A lot of the aspects of seeding the, 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 the trouble um, was during the colonial era. You know, before the British and these people, you know, created these uh, lines, you know, um, uh, after the colonial period uh, while it was ending, you know, um, there were communities that still got along, that still, uh, you know, to a degree were able to, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, attain commerce and attain national borders and identities. This area, even during the Ottomans, you know, um, the Ottomans were able to keep, uh, you know, the nations from fighting each other. Uh, there has always been wars that have been started due to the tribal relationships and the religious relationships that must end. And this is a, a right step in telling everyone the past has been the past. We've been fighting for thousands of years in the regions. But for the future of our children, 
we must look forward and we must say that Israel is there. Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel is supported by the United States. It is better to form a state where everyone can live, the Palestinians and the Israelis, and then other um, Islamic countries that have been promoting the destruction of Israel now understand that the destruction of Israel is going to result in the destruction of the Islamic nations as well. So we have to get away from this mentality of destruction. The same thing I feel about India. India and that Kashmir issue, I feel very, with my heart, horrible uh, for the Kashmiris and what they're going through. But once again, I look at the example of Europe. Europe, within Europe, is not a, a, a complete Europe that is just country after country that is a large country. You have little countries in Europe that sort of, in my view, um, ease the tension of cultural boundaries. You know, you've got Luxembourg and Liechtenstein and, and Monaco and Switzerland. You know, sometimes you cannot have people dominated one culture by the other. It's a very old mentality where one culture needs to dominate another culture. People should understand also at times that if there are um, two uh, entities uh, uh, that are politically entrenched in different ways, and there is a contentious issue that they should relieve that stress. And, and I'm a big believer that uh, inshallah one day Kashmir can become like a Switzerland and relieve the stress between India and Pakistan because India and Pakistan and the people of India and Pakistan have to think about their population and to spend that much in military every year is insane. And we've seen this with the COVID virus. Today, all that military is junk. One virus, if it comes back even worse, and the bioterrorism can wipe out all the militaries there. So we've seen that as like uh, 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 like some sort of hallucinogenic fools, we've been trapped in some glass, you know, glass house uh, as India and Pakistan, and remnants of a of 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 of, of an old uh, you know political system that needs to be on both sides put to rest, and this sort of barking is the worst thing that we can do for our population and, 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 the, and the future of both countries. Um, China is also wielding its power, um, but I think China, um, if India and Pakistan and the former colonistic states like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, uh, Afghanistan, they come together, they will be uh, as a size, as an economic area, you know, on par with China. And this is what perhaps the Chinese are afraid of as well, you know, because they're always, uh, and this is once again, an old mentality, you know, these old mentalities and people that have these strategies to divide and conquer, these all have to go away. And, and what we must do, I think, as Pakistan and the, and, and the people in Pakistan that are in power or will be in power one day, there's a way to turn this around and which is the rhetoric has to be of peace. You know, we have always, when I've seen how Pakistan has reacted, it's always been to put up the military. It has always been to put up the armed forces because we have to be strong because India is there and, you know, it's David versus Goliath. This has become a now a different age. This is an age where um, peace and talking of peace and talking of not war, but the fact that Pakistan is an incredibly important state in between the East and the West, and it cannot be denied. And we have that confidence. And in order for that confidence to grow, we allow countries like China and the United States to come and do business. And even the Indian uh, uh, population, very soon, Shahabai, uh, very soon, I say 30, 40 years from now, fossil fuels and the thing that has been running all these wars and these issues and the tensions for so many years are going to be a thing of the past. You know, we're seeing what's going on with electric cars and renewable energy. You know, Pakistan is sitting on such massive reserves of resources that India doesn't have, uh, China doesn't have. They are going to need Pakistan to, to for the future of energy consumption, you know, future of products. And that knowing that and having that confidence, I don't think Pakistan and the government and the army or any of these people in power have to have to push these games anymore. We should be confident and we should be stable and we should talk of peace 
and we should talk of cooperation. And we have to understand even everyone's a human being. You know, a, a Chinese person, an Indian person, an American person all have families. They all have fears. No, you know, all this posturing is only done by politicians. And it's only done by people that want to conquer and divide. And, and I think the time for that is over. And um, I believe that uh, the uh, administration here in the US, uh, uh, this one, you know, if we go to it and we talk of peace and we talk of innovation, um, I think we will have uh, people that will understand and listen. Um, I think that's Ahal the Khan, thank you very much. I mean, you were, as I said, very comprehensive, very articulate. But my final question to you, because I'm talking to somebody, Shahal, I'm not treating you as a professor of economics, you know, I mean, who is just lecturing or thesis, but you are a real time investor as well. So uh, we're talking about economic opportunity, the missed opportunities, loss of valuable time. So as an investor, do you see a hope in that region where, say, China, Pakistan versus U.S.? Do you see a hope? Are you optimistic that we can do certain things which are different? But how? Your turn, Shahab. I think the most important thing in Pakistan, that it has to be um, a combination of confidence uh, from, the, from, from, from Western investors to bring equity into the country. So there has to be confidence that the legal system is going to work. Uh, and uh, the issues like record deck have to be solved. Um, we have to also take care of record deck and the re repercussions that have caused other issues in courts, like uh, the Roosevelt issue in the World Bank. I mean, all of these things do not give people confidence to invest as funds in Pakistan. Um, you know, I, I uh, really am seeing a massive amount of liquidity in the United States, a huge amount of companies now looking to come to U.S. public markets through these uh, special acquisition vehicle SPACs. I'm doing eight SPACs uh, with, um, uh, with companies that I'm putting on the NASDAQ. Uh, I just saw an Indian company in renewable energy called Repower go to the U.S. markets from India and go public for is going to go public for seven billion dollars. Now, that company will have access to the U.S. capital markets. All this money printing in the U.S. has resulted in a, almost a golden age of money. Now, why are we in Pakistan that need equity not doing this? We need, we're shouting that the Chinese, you know, the debt's going to kill us. Well, why doesn't a few Pakistani companies, and I'll be happy to talk to a few, why don't we take them to the stock market in the United States and give them all the money they want? The interest rates here for equity, I mean, for bonds are, are, are next to zero. Uh, the equity rates that investors are asking for emerging market companies are, are very attractive. And there's more money I've ever seen in my life in the stock market. So what we must do is we must um, create a bridge, um, as I said, and, and, and have companies and uh, projects that are in Pakistan that need funding. Also look to the U.S. markets. But the government needs to also help by showing investors here that Pakistan is an open uh, and a fair and a legally uh, a stable you know, country where people are not going to get ripped off or taunted because all the media outside paints it as a country where you have no legal recourse. So that is something the message is not getting here. And, and we have to create a strong message into uh, the Western side, which is Europe and the United States, that we are, 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 are going to be a open and a fair market and a fair government that follows legal process rather than shouting about it, rather than saying, saying that we're doing it, you know, and uh, and unfortunately the record dick case is still around, you know, and, you know, everybody I speak to says, okay, well, I'm not gonna invest there. They screwed up Barrick Gold. Now we can say if the Pakistan side can say, we didn't do that, but at least solve that issue, you know, at least do a settlement or just solve that issue because you're taking one mine out of 13 that only has a certain value and you're destroying the entire country's investment. So you're risking $6 billion and you're losing hundreds of billions of dollars. So uh, this is the issue. We have to think also long-term. We can't think short-term. Sahal Khan, like always, thank you very much. I-95 is duly honored, you know, with your presence and your contribution intellectually. Um, I can. The only thing I can say is God bless you, <laughs> and thank you very much. Shortly, we will be connecting again on a different path.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rabbi Jan. Okay.